this on. Good morning, everybody. Please take your seats. Uh, my name is Cameron Wilson. I'm the company secretary. Um, and just before we commence formalities today, there's just a couple of housekeeping items to attend to. Firstly, if you've got a mobile phone, could you please turn it off so it doesn't disturb us through today's proceedings. In the event of an emergency, you'll hear an alert tone. If you hear that alert tone, please stop what you're doing and prepare for evacuation. If we move, that, move to that next stage where we have an evacuation, you'll hear an evacuation tone. Um, staff from the height will guide you to the emergency exits at the back of the room and thereafter to the uh, muster assembly area, which is on Langley Park, to the south of the building. With that, over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Cameron. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elizabeth Gaines. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Fortescue Metals Group, and it is my absolute honour to welcome you to today's annual general meeting of shareholders. And before I hand over to our Chairman and Founder, Andrew Forrest AO, to commence today's formalities, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which we are meeting, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend this respect to other Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders present here today. So ladies and gent gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Fortescue Chairman, Mr Andrew Forrest. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's my really great pleasure to introduce the board. You've met Elizabeth, our co-chair, Mark Barnaba, who lead independent director and um, head of the audit committee, Jean Badish-Snyder, all-round legend. Penny, Penny Bingham Hall serves on a few boards and in very valuably, and Chairman Chow. And, uh, of course, our co-chairman, Sharon Warburton, uh, also head of the... Uh, remuneration and Fortescue People's Committee, Lord Sebastian Coe, not head of anything here, but head of everything else outside of here. Um, and Working on it. And, and Jen Morris, um, we have two Olympic gold medalists here, which is just a coincidence, they kind of like each other. And um, Chem, uh, Yu Chang, uh, Zhang, we are very honoured to have you on board. Yu Chang joins us uh, at today's meeting for the first time. You'll, you'll vote for him or, of course, not if you wish to. But I think of just a fantastic um, addition to our board. Um, used to run the Google of China called Baodu. And, of course, our company secretary, the erstwhile Cameron Wilson. So just um, very pleased to also introduce the people who do all the hard work around here, the CLT. Um, just from no particular order, Greg Lilliman, could you stand up as Chief Operating Officer? Uh, Greg looks after marketing as well as operations, um, and next to him is Julie Shuttleworth, our Deputy Chief Executive, looks after everything else. And if there's a shareholder here, may I assure you have a great custodian um, of your funds in Ian Wells. He holds the checkbook so tightly we can't get much in the way of dividends out of him, but we do our best. I Ian Wells. So as is the way, no, um, no uh, apologies. We have um, the minutes for the AGM. Uh, we've taken them as read. Uh, and there's a signed copy available to shareholders. We're going to have a um, presentation from Elizabeth Gaines. That'll be the meat of the company. I'll um, kind of skate more over the top, but um, you may be assured that every one of your directors are capable of going from 50,000 feet to five inches if required. Um, and we have a very strong board which supports our excellent core leadership team, which is led by Elizabeth. So no further ado... Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we last gathered just under a year ago, and today I certainly have the privilege to take you through the extraordinary achievements of your company and what we've delivered over the last 348 days. Uh, there is one word you're going to hear me use a little bit today, and that word is record. And that's because the financial year ended 30 June 2019 was a year of record achievements for your company. So in addition to our operational success, we launched a new product to the market. 
We approved the development of Ironbridge, we turned the first sod at Alawana, and we completed our mine to market supply chain with the opening of the Judith Street Harbour. And of course, our successes are underpinned by our people and our unique culture, which continues to set Fortescue apart. And we would not be where we are today without the hard work and dedication of the entire Fortescue team. So before I go on, let me share with you an example of our people and take you on a short tour of the Pilbara. The best part of any journey is knowing how far you've travelled where you are going. And the people that join you along the way. Our journey is with Fortescue. At Fortescue, we're helping build the world and ensuring it prospers for the future. We are committed to our customers' needs today and tomorrow. This is where you'll find us. The Pilbara in Western Australia our home since 2003 and the prime location for iron ore across the globe. It all starts here. From world leading assets and infrastructure owned and operated by us, shipping iron ore to global markets. Our continual focus is on being the safest, lowest cost, most profitable mining company. For us, Safety comes first in everything we do. We value what matters. Empowering our people, looking out for our mates. The best ideas come from a diverse workforce. It's why we invest in training and employment, creating economic opportunities, empowering generational change for Aboriginal Australians. We are committed to partnering with traditional custodians, safeguarding the environment and cultural heritage now and for the future. We've set bold targets and achieved them. We never, ever give up. Embracing innovation and new ideas, creating value for our shareholders and key stakeholders. We are proud contributors to local and global economic development supporting initiatives that address society's most complex issues, exploring new opportunities for growth, we are building a stronger future both here in Australia and overseas. Take the journey with our family. Fortescue, we're a global force. As you can see, oh, as you can see, Fortescue is a values-based business, and we do have a unique and strong culture that's maintained and strengthened by our people. And at the heart of our culture is family and safety. And unquestionably, the highlight of FY19 was our safety performance. Over the past five years, our total recordable injury frequency rate has reduced by 53%. And this year we improved our safety performance to an annual low triffer of 2.8. We're delighted with this progress while we remain very focused on achieving our goal of becoming global leaders in safety. And the critical importance of safety in our industry was never more clearly demonstrated than by the terrible tailings dam failure at Vale's operations in Brazil earlier this year. This event very rightly refocused us all as an industry on the critical risks within our business including the review and disclosure of the details of our tailing storage. And we've confirmed that we have no tailing storage facilities constructed using the upstream method, with our tailings facilities designed to the highest standards and management, monitoring and auditing processes maintained at the most rigorous level. And at Fortescue, we have a very proud tradition, which was started by Andrew, of ringing the bell every time we break a record. And I can assure you, when we announced the full year results, we rang the bell. And on top of our operational records, where we had record production in Q4 of 46.6 million tonnes shipped and a record month in June of 17.3 million tonnes, we delivered financial records. 
and that included underlying EBITDA of $6 billion, a record net profit after tax of $3.2 billion, and net debt was $2.1 billion, which is, a, which is the lowest level since we achieved our current production capacity in FY14. And it would be fairly easy from the outside to attribute these record results to the strength in the iron ore price that we saw for much of the second half of FY19. However, in reality, the benchmark price averaged $80 a tonne during the financial year. And these results are in fact a reflection of our product and marketing strategy, together with our focus on maintaining our industry-leading cost position. And our C1 costs for FY19 were $13.11 per wet metric tonne, and we've guided to a C1 cost for this financial year in the range of $13.25 to $13.75. And we have initiatives in place to mitigate the impact of inflation and maintain that low cost status, ensuring we continue to generate strong cash margins through all market cycles. And I'm pleased to say that FY20 is off to a strong start and that builds on our record FY19 performance with the Fortescue team continuing to deliver in this first quarter across safety, production and cost. And in terms of our operational performance for the first quarter, we had shipments of 42.2 million tonnes, which were 5% higher than Q1 FY19. And our C1 costs were $12.95 per wet metric tonne, which is 2% lower than Q1 FY19. And demand for our products remains strong. And that's reflected in Fortescue's contractual price realisation, which averaged 89% of the benchmark price during the quarter. And we had average revenue of $85 per dry metric tonne. And that's $40 a tonne higher than the average revenue received in the first quarter of FY19. Cash on hand increased to $3.4 billion at 30 September from $1.9 billion at 30 June. And included in that 30 September cash balance are the amounts reserved for your final dividend payment, which we paid earlier this month, and the FY19 final tax payment, which is due in December. During the September quarter, we also repaid $200 million of debt, and we refinanced our term loan on improved terms, which included the issue of an eight-year $600 million unsecured bond, and net debt at 30 September was $500 million, the lowest level since 2006. And increasing returns to you, our shareholders, remains the key objective for your company. And in this regard, FY19 was, you guessed it, a record-breaking year. We delivered record fully frank dividends of $1.14 per share, and that's a 78% payout ratio of full-year net profit after tax, and is a significant increase on our FY18 dividends, which totaled $0.23 cents per share. In October 2018, as part of our ongoing capital management initiatives, we launched a share buyback program of up to $500 million. And to date, we've acquired $139 million of shares on market, and all of those shares have been cancelled. And earlier this month, we announced an extension of this program, ensuring that this buyback remains an important part of the successful execution of Fortescue's capital management strategy. And of course, everyone at Fortescue is incredibly proud that our dividends support the work of the Mindaroo Foundation and Andrew and Nicola Forrest philanthropy. And our dividend policy remains to pay out 50 to 80% of net profit after tax, ensuring that we have the flexibility to deliver returns to shareholders while still investing for growth. And with that in mind, there's been some commentary from the federal government recently about the need for corporate Australia to invest in growth rather than paying dividends. I think you should feel very confident and proud that your company is doing both. We're investing for growth, we're investing for the future, and at the same time, we're delivering strong returns to shareholders. And the reason we have this confidence is because of our track record of disciplined capital allocation. And this chart shows accumulated net profit after tax compared with debt repayments and returns to shareholders since 2005. And since then, we've generated $14.8 billion in net profit after tax. We've made $8.7 billion in debt repayments and we've paid $5.3 billion in dividend payments to you, our shareholders. In February 2018, when the core leadership team was established, we made the decision then to integrate the operations and marketing teams. And since then, the team have worked together to deliver a product mix that aligns to the needs of the market. And perhaps the single biggest example of Fortescue's foresight, agility and ability to adapt is the introduction of West Pilbara Fines. So shipping of West Pilbara Fines, which is our 60.1% FE product, 
commenced in December 2018, and it has been very well received by the market. The Ironbridge project, which I will talk in more detail about shortly, will deliver a premium product with an iron content of 67%, and that further enhances the range of products available to our customers through our flexible, integrated operations and marketing strategy. We're very confident in the long-term demand for this premium product, and when you combine that with the Alawana development, it will increase Fortescue's average product grade and provide us with the ability to deliver the majority of our products at greater than 60% FE, which is consistent with our long-term strategy. Importantly, we will be the only major iron ore company with this breadth of product offering from its Australian operations. And that is a key differentiator for Fortescue, ensuring we continue to deliver growth in earnings and cash flow and enhance returns to you, our shareholders, through all market cycles. And integral to our ability to, our, to deliver to our customers is our fully owned and integrated supply chain. It was Andrew's vision to develop a world-leading bulk operations infrastructure integrated with exploration, with mining, processing, rail and shipping. And in June this year, we celebrated the completion of the Judah Street Harbour towage infrastructure, which completes our supply chain from mine to market. And together with Fortescue's ore carriers ensures we remain the most efficient bulk export port in Australia. Probably what we're best known for when it comes to innovation is our implementation of autonomous trucks. And Fortescue was the first company in the world to deploy CAD autonomous haulage on a commercial scale. And to date we've travelled over 35 million kilometres safely and we've moved over 1 billion tonnes of material. And just to put that another way, Every day, our autonomous fleet travels two and a half times around Australia without a driver. So we're at the forefront of this technology with our mine haulage operation set to become the first in the world to be fully autonomous. We believe that embracing technology and innovation shouldn't come at the risk of jobs. And significantly for Fortescue, our training and redeployment program has successfully transferred or upskilled employees to new roles across the business resulting in no force redundancies as a result of the rollout of autonomous haulage. And your company has a very proud track record of safely and successfully developing and operating iron ore projects in the Pilbara, having built or commenced building five iron ore mines in less than 15 years. In the past 18 months, we've announced two significant new projects, Alawana and Ironbridge, with a total investment right here in Western Australia of 3.875 billion US dollars. These projects are important to Fortescue and the state of Western Australia, creating up to 5,000 jobs during construction, 1,400 full-time site positions once operational, as well as the continued flow of benefits to our communities and the state and national economy. So turning first to Elowana, in July we celebrated an important milestone with the official sod turning ceremony for Elowana with the WA Premier, our chairman and members of the board, as well as community leaders and traditional custodians in attendance. The engineering and contracting of major works are well progressed, with significant packages either awarded or very close to award. And in fact, $330 million of contracts have already been awarded to more than 250 Australian businesses, with major steel fabrication occurring here in Western Australia. Ironbridge will be one of the most cost and energy efficient producers of magnetite ore globally, and the development of this project will leverage Fortescue's integrated mine to port infrastructure with delivery of first or expected in the first half of calendar year 2022. The Ironbridge project will be a 22 million tonne per annum facility and it has been innovatively designed to ensure its low capital intensity, its low operating cost and it's highly energy efficient with lower emissions and comparable facilities. The Ironbridge magnetite project will lead the way in improving the economics of magnetite processing in Western Australia ultimately making Magnetite a significant contributor to the West Australian economy. And of course, Fortescue started as an exploration company, and we firmly believe that early stage exploration is the key to unlocking significant value. So in addition to our iron ore exploration, which is predominantly in the Western hub in the Pilbara, we continue to explore opportunities in Australia and internationally to diversify our portfolio. Your board visited our operations in Ecuador earlier this year and it's certainly pleasing to see that our strong culture and values have resonated overseas. We've commenced drilling in Ecuador on tenements perspective for copper, and to date we've drilled over 8,500 metres. So we're driving future growth through product diversification and asset development, and that's reflected by our $96 million investment in exploration over the past 12 months, 
And we've guided for that to increase to $140 million in this financial year. China has been Western Australia's largest market for exports since 2006, and Western Australia is the largest source of iron ore for China. And as West Australians, we can all be proud that WA represents 43% of total Australian exports, despite being only 10% of the national population. Fortescue's positive, long-standing relationships with China extend beyond our deep relationships with our iron ore customers through to procurement, to financing arrangements, and we have academic policy and social linkages, along with the highly successful direct investment in Fortescue by our second largest shareholder, Hunan Valin Steel Group. The depth of our China engagement has undoubtedly been a key success factor for Fortescue, as well as for Western Australia and Australia's economic prosperity. And you will often see either myself or your chairman quoted in the press discussing the importance of the trade relationship. Because in our view, it's critical that we all have a strong narrative about Australia's relationship with China, which reflects that strong trading partnership led by the resources sector. We've seen a strong start to this financial year, and it's from the position of a sustainable, profitable business that we continue to contribute to communities and our country. Fortescue was founded by Andrew with the vision that by first and foremost creating a strong business, we would create economic opportunities and contribute to thriving local communities. And it's this vision that underpins our approach to corporate social responsibility. We're committed to setting high standards, to safeguarding the environment, and creating positive social change. Just last month, Fortescue was rated as a world leader in corporate sustainability in the annual assessment for the 2019 Dow Jones Sustainability World Index. And it was an honour to see Fortescue's economic, environmental, and social performance recognised on the global stage. And this recognition reflects our commitment to hold ourselves to the highest standards. We have a long history of supporting a diverse workforce and we're proud to be one of Australia's largest employers of Aboriginal people. We know that championing the next generation of Aboriginal leaders is essential to enabling a culture that truly supports Aboriginal people. And with that in mind, I am delighted to welcome this year's cohort of leadership excellence in Aboriginal people participants who are joining us here today. So please join me in welcoming them. And while no one element of the CSR approach is more important than another, today I would like to spend a couple of minutes talking about our focus on safeguarding the environment and our commitment to contributing it to global efforts to address climate change. We support Australia's Paris Agreement commitment to reduce emissions by 26 to 28% from 2005 levels by 2030, together with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We understand the importance our shareholders and the community place on companies acting responsibly to address climate change. And in 2018, we expanded our climate change disclosure to align with the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures established by the G20 Financial Stability Board. We're working to reduce our CO2 emissions and we've set voluntary short-term targets for our operations and the voluntary long-term goal to achieve net zero operational greenhouse emissions in the second half of the century. During FY19, we did see a 10% increase in emissions, and that was due to our expanding mine operations, which led to increasing haul distances and additional diesel use, together with the commencement of early works at Alawana. At Fortescue, we're continuing to work on opportunities that have the potential to lower our costs while also reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and we're focused on practical and innovative solutions. In 2015, we commissioned the Fortescue River gas pipeline, and our use of gas reduces diesel consumption at Solomon and drives sustainable improvements in greenhouse gas emissions and energy intensity. And of course, our world-leading autonomous haulage project and our innovative use of the relocatable conveyor at Cloudbreak is reducing our mobile fleet and therefore our diesel fuel requirements and emissions. And in November last year, we announced a significant hydrogen partnership agreement with the CSIRO and we believe hydrogen is a potential future source of energy for our operations. But we also see the possibility for this technology to establish bulk export market opportunities in the next decade. And this could be an important development for Fortescue and for Western Australia. And just over a week ago, we were delighted to announce the Chichester Solar Gas Hybrid Agreement with Alinta Energy. The Chichester Solar Gas Hybrid Project will see the construction of a 60 megawatt solar generation facility at the Chichester hub 
which comprises our Christmas Creek and Cloudbrake mines, which together produce around 100 million tonnes of ore annually. In addition, there'll be an approximate 60 kilometre transmission line linking the Chichester hub with Alinta's Newman gas-fired power station and 35 megawatt battery facility, and that will be constructed by mid-2021. Once that's completed, up to 100% of daytime stationary energy requirements at the Chichester hub will be provided by solar generation, with the remaining power requirements to be met through the integrated battery storage and the gas power station facilities. This project is expected to displace around 100 million litres annually of diesel that's currently used in the existing Christmas Creek and Cloudbreak power stations. And this project also represents a further step in the creation of our Pilbara Energy Connect project. We will invest an additional $250 million in energy transmission infrastructure, which will complete the integration of Fortescue's iron ore operations into an energy efficient network. And importantly, this project will demonstrate what can be achieved when committed parties work together towards a shared goal. We firmly believe that industry, government and community working together can achieve Australia's climate change goals through a nationally consistent approach that incentivises economic development and job creation. So that brings me back to our values and our unwavering commitment to investing in the future, in our people and in our communities. And fundamentally, our approach to CSR is about our people and our values. And at the heart of our culture is family, trust and respect. Respect for each other and for the broader community. We believe we're in a unique position to empower individuals within our business and the community to be their best, to find innovative and practical solutions to the most complex business and societal challenges, and to find ways to improve the business bottom line while delivering positive social change. So on that note, I would like to give the last word to our people, and they are best placed to talk about how they work day in, day out, to ensure our communities benefit from Fortescue's success. At Fortescue, we are investing in the future. The future of our people. And the future of our communities. Since the beginning, safety and family have been at the heart of our values and culture. Because we're always looking out for our mates and making sure every one of our Fortescue family members goes home safely at the end of every shift. In 2019, our unwavering focus resulted in further improvements to our safety performance. To be the best company we can be, we need innovative ideas. And these come from a team with different backgrounds, beliefs and experiences. We're building on our history of bringing our diverse team together. Today, over 450 of our team members are working flexibly and we're supporting families with access to practical solutions like the Fortescue Family Room. And in-home childcare here in Fort Headland. We believe in paying our fair share. This year, we made an economic contribution of $13.1 billion at home and overseas. We welcome the passing of Australia's Modern Slavery Act. And continue to work with our suppliers to reduce the risk of slavery in our supply chain. Tackling climate change is everyone's responsibility. We are committed to investing in ways to reduce our emissions intensity by increasing our efficiency and use of natural gas and renewable energy. And we're partnering with our country's brightest minds to unlock the potential of renewable hydrogen fuel. We are proud to be one of Australia's largest employers of Aboriginal people, providing training, employment and business development opportunities. And we remain committed to working with our native title partners to protect their culture and heritage. By building on long-standing relationships. Providing practical support. And investing our time to work directly with local people and organisations. Communities will benefit from Fortescue's success. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll now hand back to our chairman for the formalities. Chairman. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, that is a, it's been a record year, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really humbled to be representing all of you as our stakeholders um, to your CLT and your board uh, who have really put in an outstanding year. You know, I remember when we were setting this company up and I was explaining to Analysts um, who often struggle with the concept that you're going to build a multi-billion dollar operation out of nothing. And, um, and when you finally talk them all through it, and they'd say, well, Mr. Forrest, you can have dividends 
We're going to have a yield company. We're going to have a growth company, like no dividends and all growth. And um, I said, no, no, we'll have both, mate. And um, he said, no, no, you don't get it, Andrew. You don't have both. You have one or the other. The market's got to invest in you as a yield company or the market wants to invest in you as an exciting company, but unfortunately no yield. And I said, no, I want to build a mining company that does both. I want to build a responsible Australian company that's not necessarily just mining, but stands on its management, stands on its leadership that does both. And I think we're getting there, ladies and gentlemen. We've had a very strong yield. This year is looking very positive as well. And you've got an extremely hard working culture of family, of inclusiveness, of energy, commitment, determination, trust, basically a commandment to love each other at Fortescue. Otherwise you can go work for other companies, but at Fortescue this is who we are. Care for each other, look after each other. And in many ways these massive assets we have, and you heard on that video, owned and operated by that magic two letter word we're all in here, ladies and gentlemen, us. Us. Those assets now rival the best in the world for what we do. The most efficient port operations, the most efficient rail operations, the most efficient mining operations, the first and the largest in autonomy. Trucks which are now, and equipment which are making our work place and workforce even safer. And look, I'd have to say, we really owe it to the people who came before us. And there's a great man in the audience who's going to get really crabby that I asked him to stand up because he's got a very sore leg. But we've got to say, Nev, sorry, Digger, stand up, mate. Our former chief executive, Nev Power. <laughs> so the CLT with Elizabeth built on Nev's record, and we have really global scale operations. We can flick that chart back. Thank you very much. Um, we have global scale operations, which I'm truly proud of. You heard that we um, opened the Judith Street Harbour and that draws to an end, that monumental journey to be in complete control of our entire operational line, to be totally vertically integrated. And, um, and I'm just delighted that we are. So, you know, the characteristics which got you to be in this room, which, uh, which got you to be successful, to have the wherewithal and the choice and the, and the very wise decision making to um, lead you to be a director in Fortescue, come from our parents, come from our carers, come from who moulded us as kids, that great lottery of life that, you know, these fantastic Indigenous leaders here and all of you have won by being able to be here. Well, I, I need to thank, you know, my mum and dad, who really hate being pointed out even more than Nev, um, for their contribution. And, you know, I just, I just say to everyone who is bringing up kids, they're going into a scary environment. They're going into a world which won't look like the one we grew up in. It will have most of its decisions made by computers and by machines. We work very closely with about 40 of the leading artificial intelligence frontier technology experts to do what small bit we can to ensure this massive technology which is breaking across the world does good, not harm. And believe it or not, there are those in our population who think actually humans have probably had their shot that maybe there's another form of life. And so when I hear those words from people who you'd otherwise quite respect, then I think we've got a big job to do because artificial intelligence and technology must only ever serve humanity, must only ever look after the interests of the environment, the natural environment, and not just the Anthropocene, not just the human race. And this is what I'm seeing in the application of technology at Fortescue by our team. We are certainly a mining company, but we are very much a leadership company. You've, you've got your team here, the CLT, thank you, um, who work around the clock. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's, there's great work-life 
balance at Fortescue. It's you have work and then you have work. Um, and, um, and, you know, and of course, that's what it's like in the kitchen of leadership at Fortescue. Everyone goes very hard at bringing up their families, respecting their loved ones, loving their loved ones. But at the end of the day, if you're in leadership, you're responsible for an operation which commands nearly 10,000 people, runs 24 hours a day, every day of the year, and their safety is in and on your hands. So, yeah, I am grateful for my CLT, and I'm grateful on, on your behalf. And as we look ahead even further, ladies and gentlemen, into energy and autonomy, sorry, I'll just take you to our board. Um, could we flick that? Thank you. Not as practice, this is my erstwhile chief executive. Um, but the board, I don't think, needs further introduction, but I have mentioned that that heavy technology future which your children are going to face, we need to be completely on top of it. Fortescue, in many ways, like Indigenous employment, like the global war against modern slavery, and one we're just starting against waste plastic, your company, Fortescue, has to lead by its own example. Your company, Fortescue, has to have leaders in control of those levers of power which command this company's future, who really know globally what is happening in the world of advanced technology, frontier technologies. And, you know, Yachin, very grateful to have you on board, sir. Yachin met each other um, a while ago. Fortunately, Yachin was stepping down in this, from this enormous responsibility of running Badu, and I explained to him the deep challenges we have at Fortescue and the tremendous opportunities, and then the broader challenges which humanity has with controlling the technology and making sure it serves humans' interest, first and foremost, through protecting the environment. And Yachin, I'm very grateful came on board and joined a, a, a cracking team. This is a, this is a team which you know, has two Chinese members, has four members who live overseas, has equal number of women to men. And I can tell you, I don't think women are better leaders than men. I don't think men are better managers than women. But I can tell you what, they're very different. The diversity of thinking, that equality of standing, leads to a tremendous diversity of thinking, and that's what's driving your company forward. We're not a, we don't believe that one group of people has all the answers, so we reach out to as many groups with the greatest diversity as we possibly can to seek out the wisdom to serve you, our shareholders, best. And it's, it's paying dividends. When you look at energy and autonomy, you've heard this tremendous result ditching 100 million litres of fuel, and that's just the start, ladies and gentlemen, to all solar and natural gas, the lowest carbon form of fossil fuel in the world. I don't want to underestimate that. When we built Cloudbreak, we were just so grateful to have any kind of energy source we could find. Same as Christmas Creek. We started to get a lot smarter by Solomon when we brought in a gas pipeline, and now to switch back all of these massive operations, Christmas Creek and Cloudbreak, get up there and see them, ladies and gentlemen. They are so worthwhile. Seeing the scale of these operations, almost life-changing. When we've brought on captains of industry, people have been immensely successful in fields all over the world, incredibly diverse and away from mining. They look at what's been achieved in Western Australia by West Australians, by Australians, and they just shake their head. They say, your country's going to be unstoppable. So I really applaud the horsepower of intellect and grit and determination which your leadership has, which your management has, which is going to drive this company forward at the earliest possible opportunity. You can be assured, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to rest a day on this to make Fortescue one of the first resources companies which are entirely carbon neutral in the world. We're not going to rest until we get there, and I'm not sure if we'll fully make it, but I can tell you what, there'll be no lack of sweat or energy left to make it happen, and in the process build not only a, 
a fully environmentally responsible company, an immensely profitable company, and a company that strongly takes its shareholders, its stakeholders, and most importantly to us, our community with us. And it doesn't mean that we always agree. You know, there's a section of the Robin population which we don't agree with. You know, I happen to have grown up near that town. My mates from Robin are all dead. The alcoholism and the drugs and the wanton misbehaviour the fact that kids don't go to school. That's not a community I'm going to empower with tens of millions of dollars of your cash. I'm not going to empower those leaders to continue doing worse what they have been doing badly. But seven, or seven of eight of the other claimants, sure we've had vigorous discussions, but we've always reached fabulous agreement. And like the full Aboriginal community, they see that at the heart of Fortescue is a deep wish to end the disparity between Aboriginal and everyone else in our country. We have to end it, ladies and gentlemen. And we're not going to let ideology get in the road. We're going to end it by example. We're going to end it by providing opportunities. So 2.3 billion dollars worth of jobs to Indigenous companies, only 10 times that of the National Government of Australia by your one company, Fortescue. And the highest levels of any major company in Australia of Indigenous employment. And not because we're bleeding hearts, ladies and gentlemen. Aboriginal people are fantastic. The more you get to know Aboriginal people, the more you love them, the more deeply you respect them. Doesn't mean you agree with them all but it does mean they're on the journey with you. So if I could just show you a little bit about where the dividends from Fortescue goes, um, where Nicola and I are fortunate enough to be able to husband and to be able to manage those great assets and take you to a, um, a I think, a major work, which everyone at Fortescue, and I know everyone who works at Fortescue has every right to be proud of, and that's... The, the global fight to end modern slavery, 40 million people plus still have no control whatsoever of their own lives, aren't paid and subsist at the behest of greed, of capitalism, which has entirely gone wrong, or people who just have no idea. You've, hear, hear me, you've heard me speak of my deep commitment to ending the disparity through employment and training and equal opportunity through Generation One, building communities and collaborating against cancer worldwide through th ensuring, and I'll dwell on this a little bit, that our oceans return to flourishing, which your children will not see what you grew up with. They will see oceans which are blue but don't have wildlife. They'll see oceans which are vast but are unnatural because plastic and over-exploitation killed that massive ecosystem, 99% of the world's livable space, is in those oceans. So, you know, and that's to not to say you've heard me speak really earnestly about how we owe it to our carers as children to give us the best shot. That from inception to five years of age, your whole shot at life is going to be set. And we want our kids of Australia to be given that equal shot through Thrive by Five. So I'll just give you a quick um, sparky little video summary of Mindaroo and then take you to one of our initiatives. Thank you.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's um, so. That gives you a quick snapshot. Mindaroo operates very much in partnership with Fortescue. It's an integrated partnership. Mindaroo is not funded by Fortescue. It's funded by the dividends which Fortescue creates, which is a tremendous discipline. You should all be grateful for it. That that philanthropy needs that dividend flow to keep going, to keep on rolling. And uh, and your CFO, Ian Wells, you know often has an argument with us about dividends. Well, not with me, I'm independent from it. But, um, but we, we all know that without the tremendous financial performance of Fortescue, none of what is happening behind you would happen. But what I can share and what I'm delighted about and has been since day dot is that Fortescue does use its tremendous critical mass, its energy, its ability to speak to thousands of people all at once and its huge economic credibility to help open doors and to make things happen, which Mindaroo does. And I'll just share one of these with you. It's called See the Future. And this is a global initiative to raise the value of waste plastic to be an article of value so it can no, so will no longer from that point be thrown out. See, we've generated nearly 7 billion tonnes of plastic since we started several decades ago. And most of that, 90% of that, has gone into the environment. And plastic doesn't break down. It sticks around for centuries. It just becomes more and more poisonous, more and more dangerous. So we pull together. Some of the largest companies in the world take Reliance. It's the biggest petrochemical company in Southeast Asia, one of the largest companies in the world. They make Asia's plastic. They've come on board. You take the largest company in the world, which also happens to be the largest oil and gas producer in the world, called Saudi Aramco, huge petrochemical establishment. They've come on board. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Unilever, coming on board. So this is the critical mass of credibility that Fortescue and Mindaroo brings together and approaches these other extremely large companies and says, hey, we can fix this. You have equal responsibility with all of us to ensure we do not leave our oceans as deserts of life through our selfish generation, through our visionless generation, but in fact use our selflessness, use our vision, use our energy to save our oceans and have them as flourishing as possible. And I'll just show you a quick video which has the chairman of the world's largest company, has the group global president of Coca-Cola, has the chief executive globally of Unilever, has the head of environment for the United Nations. People with immense clout, ladies and gentlemen, just speaking about this. Thank you. The bad news is coming. See, plastic was designed by the great chemists of the world to be one of the greatest inventions of any economy in history. But it was not invented for the environment. The ocean is in a dire state. Increasing temperatures, deoxygenation, marine pollution and littering are threatening biodiversity and killing marine life by the scores. And just to give you an idea of the magnitude of this uh, challenge. Just since we sat down around the table here, more than 100 metric tons of new plastic have entered the ocean. And most of it will stay there for decades and centuries. And we want the world to know there is a solution and we know how to do this. And actually, if we all coordinate, this isn't too hard to solve. What's the solution? The solution is pretty straightforward, and that is there's a voluntary contribution placed on virgin polymer per tonne. Fundamentally, it creates value out of plastic. This solution, I think, is not just a solution for the plastics crisis, but it's also an example for other, other systemic issues we face. You know, private sector-led, creative, led by some inspirational people, systemic, getting the private sector on board, 
it is a model, I think, for the, for the 2020s and solving a whole range of challenges. But we're most excited about better plastic, which, you know, I'm sitting here seeing Bill, the father of circularity. Um, and so we've got to build circularity into our packaging. But of all things, we have to step up our use of recycled materials so that the plastic stays in the economy and out in the environment. The reason why, why I'm here today, uh, after uh, about three weeks of uh, meeting uh, Andrew, is just to, to demonstrate our uh, commitment to all of this. And I hope, um, I hope we will find better ways to get all of this plastic uh, back uh, from the environment to, to the economy. And in this way, I think we will have uh, a better chance to get it done. And when you see Andrew's idea, I also said something to Andrew that is just, you know, what really impacted me. This is not just about plastic. This is about helping poor people. And this is about vulnerable communities. This is about, you know, it's a complete cycle, Andrew. It's just, it's about eliminating plastic because plastic is damaging our lives, but it's also about giving dignity to the most vulnerable. So thank you. Clearly, this idea of having that levy, that plastic levy, and having it at the polymer level, if you like, and, and driving a degree of uh, value into what today is waste is critical. We endorse completely bringing in new ways of grappling with these sorts of issues because we have to shift the trajectory. Because with the current trajectory, we won't reach the SDG uh, goals. We will not reach the outcome required by Paris. We will not get there. We will not save the oceans. We need to shift the trajectory. It's the young people that are in the streets right now. They are requiring... They are requiring that we drive forward with some concrete solutions. We've been talking about things for a long time and now we come to the point where in one area we're reaching a tipping point where we can actually tip it back. Let's look not just ahead but look let's look at what's coming behind us and welcome it and 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 encourage it and let it happen. Let it happen. Yeah, it gets pretty passionate, old Harrison. Um, so look, whether or not you, we're protecting human rights or doing our level best to stop plastic ever entering the ocean again, we're really ready for 2020. Whether or not it's from Robin to Columbia, we're sticking up for the least privileged, creating opportunities wherever we possibly can. And I think... Um, I think, certainly if you look at this family, really making a difference. And if I could, now, ladies and gentlemen, um, take you to the formal part of the meeting. You know how much I love this part. Um, and uh, to streamline the details as much as possible, the proxy votes and voting uh, restrictions for each resolution will be displayed on the screens behind me, so I don't have to read them out to each of you. You'll be as relieved of that as I am. And shareholders and their proxies, corporate representatives will be given the opportunity to ask questions relevant to today's meeting um, after each resolution is being considered. If you do have a question, please raise your white or blue admission card, which you received when you registered, and state your name and by all means then address the meeting. If you have a red or green card, just a reminder, you're not entitled to speak. So, in accordance with the constitution, the voting procedures and those um, left at my discretion, I advise we hold a poll in resolution one through to five inclusive. I'll hand over now to um, Company Secretary Cameron Wilson to explain the procedure. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Andrew always likes to leave the exciting stuff to me. so. As the Chairman's advised, we'll be conducting a poll today. In that regard, I appoint Mr Chris Hernandez uh, from the company Share Registry Link Market Services to, con to conduct that poll. In terms of the poll procedure, persons entitled to vote on this poll are all shareholders, representatives and attorneys of shareholders and proxy holders who hold white voting cards. 
This card will, uh, you will find a series of boxes for voting. Please indicate on the card how you wish to vote by ticking or marking the appropriate square for each resolution. You must mark either for or against box for the vote to count. Once you have finished marking your card, please place it in one of the ballot boxes which will circulate the room after all of the resolutions are read. We are also pleased to offer shareholders who are attending the meeting in person here today the option to lodge their vote using their mobile phone or tablet device. Shareholders who are using the Link Vote app to lodge their votes electronically, please follow the prompts on your device to lodge your vote. If you have any questions about how to use the Link Vote app during the meeting, please speak with one of the Link staff located in the shareholder registration area. If there are any aspects regarding the voting on which you are uncertain, please do not hesitate to ask the Link staff who will be circulating the room with the ballot boxes after all the resolutions are read. The Chairman will close the meeting following the collection of poll papers. The results of the poll will be announced to the ASX later today. Um, over to you, Chairman. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We will go straight to the first item of business, receiving the financial reports. Um, are there any questions in relation to the financial reports? Price Waterhouse Coopers are here to take them if there are. Okay, we'll take them as read. Thank you. Resolution one, the adoption of the remuneration report. Um, details are on the screen. Oh, sir. You want this for the adoption of the financial reports? No worries, far away. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Len Roy from the Australian Shareholders Association. Um, we're representing 148 shareholders today and approximately 741,000 shares. Mr Chairman, it's well known ASA volunteers like myself are expected to hold ASX 200 uh, companies to account and particularly in the areas of uh, governance, uh, financial performance, uh, remuneration and other public disclosures. In 2019 our focus issues were and are board composition, remuneration disclosure, skin in the game as we call it and fair and equal treatment for all shareholders, it's institutional shareholders as well as singular and retail shareholders. Specifically in the case of FMG, you've had a record year in just about all facets of the business and we acknowledge that there exists a good level of alignment with ASA policy guidelines as they apply to ASX 200 companies. We've had a respectful and collaborative meeting with FMG this year, as we have in quite a number of earlier years. And I think there's been good progress on both sides. As you said earlier, not always agreeing, but generally we, we're on the same path. From a shareholder's perspective, we do wish to acknowledge the exceptional overall performance achieved in financial year 19. It's uh, very in exceptional. There are many industry leading accomplishments in the areas of safety, C1 costs, cash flow, debt reduction, plus the lowering of interest costs on borrowings and the flattening of the debt maturity profile. All have been covered deeply and suitably by Elizabeth. Not to forget the higher average realised prices, partly due to global commodity pricing and partly the FMG unique blending arrangements. FMG has indeed raised its own performance bar across all areas of the business and the shareholders will note, and I've mentioned this for the benefit of all in the room, note that the performance guidelines for financial year 20 are in the September quarterly production report. It's well worth reading. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, sir. I don't expect everyone will get a clap, but, um, if, but I thank you for that deep alignment. Um, so could I then take us to resolution one, the adoption of the remuneration report. Details are on the screen. Before I open, open to questions, just like to make the point that, uh, that 
we work hard to ensure that we have complete alignment of the leaders and senior managers of the company with our values, which reflect those which built this company, and I'm sure in every respect our values which you, our shareholders, would appreciate. Um, we have at the core of this a strategy which drives accountability into each of us while we protect each other and support each other, strengthen each other, we also hold each other to account to ensure we um, reach the outcomes for which you, our shareholders, can be proud of. And they're made up of non-financial measures as well, and it's something which I absolutely insist on. And, of course, the financials just didn't get there on their own. Something drove them. Something made it happen. So if you just look at the financials, ladies and gentlemen, then A, you're wet behind the ears, but B, you, you could turn an organisation into the greed which we've seen uh, Commissioner Haynes speak so poorly of in the parts of the banking sector. So yes, we do drive non-financial parameters very hard because they in turn drive not only financial results, that's part of the cake, but credibility and integrity and community involvement and support. So these, rem these remuneration outcomes are in line. We've, as you know, we've had a 24% improvement in safety. We um, continue our very high levels of employee engagement. We have had really strong net profit after tax performance of 3.2 US billion and EBITDA of 6 uh, billion US. And total dividends, as you know, um, are $1.14 per share. And of course, we don't let our chief executive and CLT rest on that, say, so, okay, that's the next hurdle you have to jump, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and they're up for it. So uh, the, it, it's consistent with the world-class assets we have. We shipped just under 170 million tonnes last year. But look, I could go on and on and on about the reduced debt, very strong balance sheet. We've almost got as much cash on the balance sheet as we have debt on the balance sheet right now. And all those assets you saw in the video, you own 100%. So, I'm pretty happy with the performance of the company. Are there any questions? What's up? Not at this point. Okay, no questions? Uh, over here, Andrew. Okay. Thank you for your very um, encouraging report this morning. In stating the company's position that scope three emissions should not be taken into account, in the project approvals process, our Chief Executive Elizabeth Gaines said Fortescue supports the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and its mandate for countries to take responsibility for their own emissions. I'm concerned if we're not taking scope three emissions into account in our own strategic planning and capital expenditure decisions, Fortescue is exposing itself to huge climate transition and stranded asset risk. For example, China is due to update its commitments under the Paris Agreement next year. If its targets are brought into line with the Paris Agreement's overarching goals, which our company supports, China's emissions would need to fall by at least 30% by 2030. So while I appreciate the CEO's comments about the country's taking responsibility for their own emissions, doesn't that pose significant financial risks for our company? And how are those risks being managed? Okay, so just to explain what scope three jargon is, ladies and gentlemen, it basically says that um, you're responsible for what your customers, what your clients do with their own carbon outputs. And if you take that a bit further, maybe you should be responsible for your customers' customers, and maybe, let's go right down to there, maybe you should be responsible for everyone. And of course, I don't agree with that. I think you must control what you can control. So I would support Elizabeth, sir, um, that, we, we, that we are not responsible for other organisations. Um, but the product we ship and we sell, we're tremendously proud of. You, ladies and gentlemen, have not taken up tripping roasts of investment opportunities in low-grade thermal coal, which we could have made a lot of money from. And we turn our backs on them because we don't think they're the future 
we don't think in the long term they're best for our world either. And we're driving extremely hard with hydrogen. I'd rather go tangible. If we can crack the solid hydrogen mix out of water, then it won't just help Fortescue. And we're playing capital into that and we're making progress. But if we crack that, then China's not going to use any more thermal coal. That's how we make a really strong contribution. But I know Elizabeth is itching to speak, um, so I shouldn't hold her back. Thank you, Chairman. No, just really to reiterate Andrew's comments, I mean, we do work with our customers. So we're clearly, whilst we're not taking responsibility for scope three, we work closely with our customers. We're looking at our long-term product mix. We're looking at you know, the, the high-grade magnetite concentrate product. We think will be really well sought after as China moves around down that path of improving their emissions. I think one of the things that will be common moving forward is still the demand for iron ore in the steel making process. So we know that our customers are looking at alternate sources of energy, to Andrew's point, uh, to replace coal, for example. Steel mills in Japan and Korea, when Greg and I were there earlier this year, are talking about hydrogen. But they are talking about that maybe in a decade's time, 2030. So there's a lot of work going into what is an alternate source of fuel for the steel making process. But I think the one ingredient that will remain common is iron ore. So we, we are making long-term decisions. We're looking at our product mix. And importantly, we're, we work very closely with our customers as they're on this journey. Thank you, sir. Does anyone else on the board want to make any comment about this? You're most welcome. Another, you have another question, sir? And then you, sir. Uh, you'll forgive my concern on this issue. At the moment, our company doesn't even disclose our scope three emissions, nor any scenario analysis demonstrating how our markets, sorry, how our markets would fare under a Paris aligned carbon constrained scenario. So shareholders are left in the dark about the level of climate risk facing our company. Are our institutional investors asking for disclosure of scope three emissions and detailed scenario analysis? I'd love to, Elizabeth, but I'll leave it to you. <laughs> uh, the answer to that is no, they haven't asked for that, uh, for that information or for that detail. So we haven't been asked that question of um, any of our institutional investors. Um, but you know, clearly we're on a journey in terms of our, our disclosures and our modelling. We're looking at our own scope one and two. I think what is really important is making sure we get our own house in order. So scope one and two are absolutely critical. So everything we're doing around the solar gla uh, gas hybrid project in the Chichesters is an important part of our journey, as Andrew mentioned earlier, around that scope one and two. And we will continue to work with our customers uh, as, as they develop and, and also look at their own emissions control. Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, encouraging them through the strength of our own successful example is the best way to go. And uh, we cannot be responsible for what other people do, which we cannot control. But we can make sure we get our own house in order and we can do everything possible to get as quickly as possible to zero net carbon emissions. I think that'll be a phenomenal achievement for a large industrial company. And secondly, we are spending your capital on charging ahead with solar, and solar to hydrogen remains a great possibility. There was another card over here. Madam, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks again for all your hard work over the last financial year. Um, I did have some further comments on, on this question because earlier this year BHP announced that it's going to be setting public goals for addressing its scope 3 emissions which they're going to be externally verified and um, they're aligned with the Paris Agreement. Rio Tinto also partnered with its biggest iron ore customer in China to reduce its scope 3 emissions in the steel making value chain. So I guess my concern is that the actions that these companies are taking, especially BHP, are going to lead them to overall less carbon intensive and more efficient processes. And in the long term, I can see that that would put our peers at a significant advantage over our company, uh, particularly if carbon pricing was enacted uh, as the world moves towards meeting its Paris climate agreements. 
So will Fortescue, you know, set Paris aligned targets to reduce scope three emissions and avoid being left behind our peers in this way? Okay, I don't think we are being left behind. Some of these companies have made broad statements about the things that they're doing. Like one of them said that they're gonna have 50% of the workforce female in a couple of years time. That's gonna create nice headlines little sugar hits for that chief executive or for uh, some representatives in the environmental community or the diversity community. But that's not how we roll. We're not here for a headline or a sugar hit. We're here to lead by example. Now, I'd like to see Rio go carbon neutral. That'd be pretty cool. I'd like to see BHP get out of coal. coal that'd be pretty cool too. So these are the big meaningful things which these huge companies are doing which is smashing any chance of going carbon neutral. So I'm happy that we're leading from the front by our own example, not through press release. Yeah, would you like another question? Sorry, thank you. So BHP's commitment saw them avoid a shareholder resolution calling for scope three emissions reduction targets and Rio faced a shareholder re resolution uh, last financial year and is expected to again this financial year. Um, will Fortescue uh, need a financial or need a shareholder resolution to uh, make a commitment to reducing its scope three emissions? Look we could have 75 shareholder resolutions madam. If we don't believe we can control people who are completely independent from us and bear in mind what you're talking about uh, very serious thermal coal exporters. So you're dressing this up as a non-thermal coal player, an organisation which has had dozens of massive thermal, highly profitable coal opportunities given to it, which would hit the bonuses of everyone inside Fortescue, and we've walked away from them. So I really don't appreciate being held to account as a clean company by the press statements of companies which exist on the most polluted form of energy, when we've just switched through hundreds of millions of dollars to solar and gas. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and the audience, um, one issue that should be given attention, and because I have a background on Woodside and what they're doing, um, and Woodside is encouraging people in their shipping to go to LNG. I believe uh, BHP uh, uh, is going to put out a tender, uh, which, which Woodside will uh, obviously uh, apply to. Uh, and it, 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 so it affects other, other iron ore miners such as Rio and yourselves, as to whether you'll convert your shipping to LNG, which is more efficient. Yeah, so I that's one issue. Yep. Uh, the, the other issue which people need to keep focused on in the next few years, that coking coal will be replaced by hydrogen. Uh, and, and, and there's quite a few companies uh, that are going to uh, see that hydrogen as piped to other countries, such as Korea and so forth. And, 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 and this op opens up the place of coking coal and steel production. And so that's a big thing for the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. They're great remarks. And, um, and we're, we're sympathetic to them. We're moving uh, very fast to low sulphur fuel in all our ships. And um, a dream of ours is to con convert them to natural gas as well. So we're, we're um, fully aligned. Elizabeth, do you want to make any comment? No, I agree with that, Chairman. Uh, the sulphur fuel cap comes in on 1 January, so we're well prepared for that with low, low sulphur fuel. I think also, whilst LNG is an opportunity for the ships, actually I think we're thinking further ahead in terms of hydrogen and the opportunity for hydrogen to fuel the ships as well. So lots of opportunities. Yeah, I think if we have a choice, we'd have low sulphur, low sulphur fuel, then gas, but what we're aiming at, sir, is hydrogen. Any other questions? Mr Forrest, um, I was deeply concerned to read the other day that FNG is considering appealing the 
2017 um, exclusive native title granting that was given to the Injibandi people, um, which encompasses the land that your Solomon mine is on. Um, why won't FMG abide by the decision of the court of this country? Um, look, I'm, I know, and you said you have said today that you don't believe royalty payments to Indigenous groups, um, or you say that it amounts to mining welfare. But I'm puzzled as to why you say that. I mean, isn't it just a case of, of paying a fair price for the product that you have got from them? I mean, since when in this country do we, do we purchase something of someone, but then we say, I don't believe you were responsible enough to deal with the re remuneration that you were due um, and pay them way below market value? but you can come and work for me, I'll give you a job. I mean, that to me is just so un-Australian and how not how this country operates. I mean, it's hard not to come to the conclusion, Mr Forrest, that FNG's only concern in this matter um, is to pay as little as possible for the huge amount of iron ore you've extracted from this people's country that is their land, that has been determined their land by the highest court in this country. Um, and you have made huge, as we have seen today, huge amounts of money from. I mean, as a shareholder of this company, I personally wouldn't care if the value of my holdings goes down as a result of compensation that you might, this company may have to pay, because I only believe that is what should have happened in the first place. They should have been properly remunerated at the beginning. And I urge you now to do the decent thing and end this long-running dispute that has embroiled the people of Robin, that I have personally seen the, the heartbreak and division that that has caused, and this company has been complicit in that. So I'd urge you to do the decent thing and just start paying what is due to these people. Thank you. Yeah, look, I probably would do that if much of what you said was true, sir. But you've built a flimsy argument on, on complete non-facts. And I would say, go and, go and spend a little bit more time with the mothers up there, sir. Learn what welfare does. Learn how it excavates trust, how it excavates morality out of communities, how it renders entire populations to portrait of hope and then offer them education, the ability to stand on their own two feet. We do pay a very fair price already. And we've, if you don't mind not yelling from the floor, sir, we pay a very fair price to the Australian people. We pay a very fair price because that is what we are asked to under the laws of this country. Now, we are seeing um, the great man, Eddie Mabo, who was able to demonstrate a continuing connection to the land, get stretched more and more to what a court will interpret. Now, we're now having an argument that a spiritual connection where one claim is that a father said you're responsible for all of this land including the safety of everyone who comes into it and leaves it. Now where I grew up sir, Aboriginal people came and went and treated, treated each other respectfully and no one had single king-like domain over everything. It's much more family than that. So are we thinking about taking it to the High Court? Yes, we may. But have we offered tens of millions of dollars of compensation already? Yes, we have. Was it board approved? Yes. Did it got, get knocked back as being not enough? Should we put one small group of people in the same place as the West Australian government for royalties? We think not. And we will probably continue to resist. But I, we haven't made up our mind. Well, thank you, sir. What about you start employing people and making a real difference, mate? <laughs> sir. There's a microphone coming, sir. Uh, we've talked earlier about um, a record year that's just uh, passed. 
um, and obviously a very high iron ore price. It could well be that part of the reason for the high iron ore price was the problems uh, that were experienced by Vale. There seems to be um, a forecast that the iron ore price will drop down to approximately seventy dollars uh, US. Does that mean, um, in essence, we should expect uh, lower profits in the forthcoming year? Is there some uh, strategy in place to maintain what are these high uh, results at the moment? Yeah, we can't, um, we can't control the iron ore price, but we can control operating excellence and our operating costs. Um, so we will guarantee you everything we can control. Um, but outside of that, saying, can we keep the commodity price up, that would be a little tough, boss. Um, but Elizabeth. Yeah, I might, I might just add, Chairman, um, I think a deliberate part of our strategy is our product mix. So we actually have outperformed the benchmark price because we've introduced a new product. So we've introduced a 60.1% FE grade product, West Pilbara Fines. We have our Ironbridge project, which will come first or on ship in the first half of calendar year 2022. So we're selling more iron units, so that means that we're seeing our price realisation of that benchmark index actually increase. So we're not just sitting there and saying, well, the price will go up and down and be, be what, it, what it may. We actually have a deliberate strategy around our product mix. And really importantly, we're keeping our costs low because the way that we can go through all those market cycles is by keeping our costs low and generating very strong margins. But we, def we definitely have a product strategy that will see us continue to improve up that uh, overall grade and we'll have a breadth of product offering from a, a lower grade to a mid grade to a high grade product and uh, that, that'll flow through into that price that we receive, the average price we receive from the benchmark. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you for the lively discourse. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. The, um, are there, is there uh, any, no further questions? I'll put the resolution to a vote. The vote is in front of you. Thank you. Now, res uh, the resolution two, re-election re of Sharon Warburton. You don't need me to state the obvious that we won that vote? No. Um, so, Mrs Warburton was originally appointed director in 2013 and served as deputy chair of the board since July 2017. Expense, extensive experience, as you know, in mining and infrastructure, construction, um, very substantial operational experience, commercial and risk management in the global resources sector, including our friends at Rio Tinto, um, and has held senior executive positions with Brookfield, Multiplex, Aldair Properties, PJSC, Multiplex and Citigroup. Um, and we regard her financial governance and uh, remuneration acumen at its highest. In recognition of her experience, she has won West Australian Businesswoman of the Year and was a finalist for Australian Financial Review's Westpac Greatest Women of Influence. This year, Mrs Warburton was made an adjunct professor of Curtin University's Faculty of Business and Law. And I'd like Sharon to make a quick statement, if you'd be so kind. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, our shareholders, regarding my uh, reappointment to the Fortescue Board. As the Chairman said, I joined the Board in November 2013, and I was initially also appointed the co-chair of our Remuneration and Nominations Committee uh, with Mr Graham Rowley. Hi, Graham. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, upon Graham's retirement, I uh, assumed the role of Chair of the Remuneration and Nominations Committee. We have changed the name of this committee recently to be the Remuneration and People Committee to reflect the importance we place on our people. I was a key member of the Nominations Committee during our CEO transition and with the appointment and transition of our current core leadership team. I've also served during my entire tenure as a member of your Audit and Risk Committee, as well as your Finance Committee. I was honoured by our Chairman to be invited to take the role of Co-Deputy Chair in 2017. It's my absolute pleasure to work alongside Chairman Forrest and with my other Co-Chair, Mr Mark Barnabar. As you heard, construction is a passion of mine, and I'm delighted to spend 
some extra time working with our major projects unit, especially during this upcoming period of Pilbara expansion relating to the Illawarna and Ironbridge projects. The Chairman has read out some of my qualifications, skills and experiences that I bring to Fortescue. So today I just want to highlight and bring to your attention some of my personal highlights over the last six years. I've been a regular visitor to all of our sites in the Pilbara and overseas. I've visited our customers in China and earlier this year I visited our exploration team in South America. I have a huge passion for, and personal focus on the health and well-being of our people. Last year I spent four days touring all of our sites during Mental Health Awareness Week. Most importantly, as it is in everything I do, it is about the people. I am proud of our Fortescue culture and I am proud to be part of the Fortescue family. I'm proud that a key part of my role is to help grow that culture. And extending beyond my Fortescue role, my passion is about building diversity and developing talent across our companies and our industries. I'm proud of our achievements to date and I acknowledge there is much more work to do. Just last week, I spoke to 650 11 and 12 year old schoolgirls about careers for women in construction and resources and how, like me, they can be a mum and have a career too. Finally, let me address the issue of how I'm managing my board work workload. Having been invited during the course of the last 12 months to join two listed ASX 200 boards. It is my intention to reduce my listed company commitments. Transitioning on and off boards does need careful consideration and it can take time. I'm working through this at the moment with Chairman Forrest and my other chairman. Most importantly, I want to let you know I intend to continue in my role at Fortescue and I'm looking forward to continuing to support you, our shareholders. And to uh, my fellow Fortescue family members, you won't see any less of me. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions? No one I've missed. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Resolution three, ladies and gentlemen, the election of Dr. Yashin Zhang. You've heard me speak of Dr. Zhang, but perhaps a little bit more formally. He's appointed a director of the company in 20 in September this year, a senior executive in, of a leading Chinese multinational um, Dr. Zhang has had various functions including technology, infrastructure, consumer business, marketing and government relations and new business initiatives including finance, education, cloud com computing, autonomous driving and global business. Prior to joining Bowdery, Dr. Zhang was a key executive of Microsoft for 16 years including as corporate vice president for mobile and embedded products, managing director of Microsoft Research Asia and chairman of Microsoft China. His knowledge and experience in the areas of autonomy, technology and innovation, I think, as you've already heard, ladies and gentlemen, will be very valuable to your company. Dr. Zhang, would you like to make a statement? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. uh, thank you, Chairman, for a very kind uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so let me just first say how excited I am to join this incredible board and this wonderful, wonderful company. Uh, as the chairman just said, I joined the board two months ago. In the last two months, and I spent uh, time working with, of course, the board, with uh, the uh, executive team, and also visited uh, the Solomon Hub to see you know, how people work, you know, our people work in the field. Um, now let me say I'm just uh, incredibly impressed by the caliber of the leadership, by the energy, and enthusiasm and the passion of our people. And also you know, by the power of the culture that our visionary chairman has instilled and cultivated. You know, ch culture is something, when I run company, we look at you know, technology, you know, products, uh, and the market, but culture is the DNA and the lifeblood of a company that goes way beyond the spreadsheet, uh, that spreadsheet, that products, or even individuals. So this is what I, really feel the most when I talk with people. Uh, 
the, you know, the value, the culture that put the safety, put the family, put the people, innovation, and frugality in the center of the proposition. I think that is very unique and powerful and lasts for a long time. Um, I'm gonna, not going to go through the so talk with myself, and, and Andrew already uh, said uh, uh, quite uh, in detail. Um, but you know, let me say this. You know, when I met uh, Andrew probably 10 or 15 years ago, a long time, at the Borough Forum, uh, and we talk a lot about you know, technology and also technology, the impact technology on society. What struck me the most was uh, not only about the great company he built, it's really the social responsibility and, and all the giving back he gave through the Mentor Foundation. And it actually reminded me of my other boss, Bill Gates, uh, that just uh, uh, the, the how much they have done to change our society. Um, so I'm always in the in tech world. Uh, I mean, when uh, Andrew, actually, uh, Nicola, both uh, were in Baidu after, actually a week after my announcement to retire, uh, they asked me to s consider to serve on the board. And I said, well, you know, I'm always doing tech. I actually know little about mining industry itself. <laughs> and uh, Andrew said, well, you know, we, Fortescue, is not only a mining company. You know, we are a company of leadership and of management, of innovation, and the company with the, the culture we just mentioned. And I think in the uh, skill with that type of business culture, uh, will be able to do anything. The mining is just uh, you know, a successful example of the, of the venture. Um, you know, so let me just use the three words to describe myself. <laughs> and I'm a uh, globalist. And I believe in free trade, globalization, and I don't, and I, I don't, I don't believe in any boundary. It's technology, the talents, or even product services. And I'm a um, technologist, and obviously I believe in technology. I'd be very fortunate uh, to live in the very center of technology and the creation of technology in the last uh, you know, 30 years, from uh, digital television, uh, multimedia, to autonomous driving, cloud computing, and of course, artificial intelligence. Uh, but also, I am uh, passionate about the power of technology in changing the world. And also, I am fully committed to steering the technology towards the serving the society you know, humanity and, and people. Um, and lastly, I'm a, uh, I'm a optimist. <laughs> I believe in you know, all the positive things the society, the world is, is moving. You know, there are always challenges, always difficulties, hurdles. Uh, but you know, human species is special in that we not only create these technologies, but we're also able to manage, able to govern and uh, you know, steer the technology to the right direction. And some of the example you're seeing, you know, we created, human being created a steam engine to extend the power of our arm. And we created artificial intelligence to expand our mind. But in the process, we do create issues, problems. But, and I'm confident, I'm optimistic. You know, when we put our efforts together, collect it, uh, intelligence together, we're able to solve this problem, just like uh, you know, what Andrew has uh, alluded, whether it's uh, a, a plastic issue, <laughs> it's a, a pollution, uh, air pollution, uh, climate change, or other issues, we as a human being, as a, a society, able to solve these issues. Again, I want to thank you for your support. I'm uh, excited about this opportunity. I'm excited to contribute to the company in the future. Thank you. Well, quite remarkable diversity right there, ladies and gentlemen, too. Excellent um, informal speeches, uh, both fabulous, I thought, um, from completely different directions. Very deep vaults of wisdom from both of them. Any um, questions on the resolution? 
No further questions. Um, they are put to a vote on the screen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Resolution four, um, increase in the fees paid to non-executive directors. Um, I propose the resolution to increase the fee pool. The current fee pool is 2.5 million um, and we propose to raise it by $500,000 to $3 million per annum. It's inclusive of superannuation contributions by the company and for the benefit of non-executive directors, any fees which a non-executive director agrees to sacrifice on a pre-tax basis. The rationale um, for the fee pool increase is um, to accommodate additional non-executive directors who may be appointed um, as part of the board's succession planning and to ensure the board continues to have the right balance of skills and experience and to ensure that the fees are set at a level that um, you know, I have to admit to you, we're never going to attract any great talent with these people. Um, we'll perhaps compensate them in some level, but it is your company and the excitement of being involved with your company, which is, I think, by far and away the greatest attractant to all the non-executives who serve on this, on this hard-working board. But um, some growth in fees to reflect future market competitiveness, competitiveness is necessary. We do operate in a marketplace um, for the experience matrix we do need. Um, and I'd be, as you probably know, um, we're well below the company average for our size for our, our fee pool in the ASX 100 index. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Probably don't think it's enough. Um, so, okay, no questions. Take that card as well. Thank you very much. So moving right along, a resolution five performance rights plan to Mrs Elizabeth Gaines to participate in the Fortescue Middle Group Limited Performance Rights Plan. This was always a favourite time of Nev Powers. It's just, um, he used to really love having his remuneration, remuneration scrutinised and debated around every breakfast table in the state. Um, and of course, Elizabeth is having such a fabulous time as well. Um, but so like Nev, I think Elizabeth and the CLT provide fabulous service, um, average well under, of course, what remuneration they could earn for companies of our size, ladies and gentlemen, we are under the average, but they are here very much like your board because of, I think, the great privilege of serving with Fortescue. The plan approved by shareholders at the 2015 AGM gave Elizabeth the um, eligibility to participate and in accordance with good governance, shareholder approval is now being sought in respect to grant of these performance rights to Elizabeth in her capacity as an executive director for the financial year ending 2020. Full details of the maximum number of performance rights you may be granted, Elizabeth, uh, during this period and relevant vesting conditions are provided in the notice of meeting, ladies and gentlemen, of your 2019 annual report. Executive incentives you would probably gather or are an in very important incentive um, and we have a strict pay for performance culture at FMG. Um, so these performance rights and their delivery is of course totally aligned with our shareholders. Any questions ladies and gentlemen before I put it to resolution? Looks like you scraped through by the skin of your teeth Elizabeth. Thank you ladies and gentlemen, great decision. Closing poll. Um, so. Would you kindly lodge your voting cards in the ballot boxes of your device? Um, all, all persons who intend to vote have now voted. Yes. Um, Piers, everyone has voted. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare the poll closed, subject to the finalisation of the poll, um, which will be announced um, later in the day. So just concluding remarks, uh, thank you very much for your patience, for your time here today. I really do appreciate it as your chairman will continue to work very hard for you for not only an exciting growth driven company but a very firmly rewarding yield company and certainly one which is thoroughly determined to leave this world a better place than we found it. Thank you very much. So if I could all join you for a cup of tea, be fantastic, make yourselves comfortable and welcome. <laughs>